So I wanted to thank the Associated Students of Clark College for the generous funding that um, promotes this program and allows us to invite these fabulous speakers to Clark College. This evening, we are joined by Dakota, Dakota Gearhart, who is has got her BFA from the Florida State University um, and her MFA from the University of Washington, where her studies were supported by a photo media recruitment scholarship, a Julianne Martin scholarship, and a Joanne Bailey Wilson scholarship. Um, since graduating and earning her MFA from the University of Washington. She has uh, participated in many residency programs, including the Vermont Studio Center, the New York Art Residency and Studios Program, and the AIM Program at the Bronx Museum. Her work um, in video, photography, and installation has been exhibited at the Henry Art Gallery in Seattle, on the ground floor in Los Angeles, Bronx Art Space, New York, and False Front in Portland. So if you guys would all join me in welcoming Dakota. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Um, and it's perfect timing because it just started raining. Okay, so thank you so much, Sensini, and I'm, I'm just going to talk about my work thematically. Usually I talk about it project by project, but I'm going to challenge you and talk about it conceptually. So you'll have to follow along. Okay, so, yeah, I'd like to start with a bit of context. I'm from Florida. I grew up on the Gulf Coast of Florida and spent a lot of time in the Everglades. Um, and I studied marine biology before I decided that I wanted to pursue art. And I was invested in marine biology because I'm interested in the emergent properties in nature. And it took me forever to learn what that meant, but what it means is the behaviors that you see, sort of like when the water moves down the river or the way that fractals appear in, in leaves, um, and the way these patterns repeat from micro to macro. Uh, and this is called in the emergent qualities of nature, right? So these things leave me in awe. Uh, and I was able to research that in Florida. But while I was there growing up, uh, I also spent a lot of time digesting pop culture and seeing a lot of um, amusement parks and tourist developments. So one thing I took away from my upbringing was uh, this sort of gorgeous paradise of tropical birds um, being sort of compartmentalized or, you know, revitalized uh, so people could come there and litter and it was a really funny conflict because I am a tourist too and I'm not, that's not like my platform to be down about that. But um, it was just, I think it's that struggle that is a point of departure for me. So what did I ended up learning was there are emergent properties in human behavior as well. Uh, this this urge to see a plot of land or like a, you know, a, a rare bird and want to own it or cage it or, I don't know, these things that, this desire we have to sort of hold things in our hand and uh, know that they are ours. Um, oh, and one story, I, or one example I'd like to share is, um, so I went to a lot of amusement parks and you'll see some in the slides and videos I show you, I take a lot of my color theory out of pop culture and advertising and this sort of like uh, gluttonous vision that they present to you, like this vision of come here, it's full of, full of uh, an escape from your life. Uh, so like for example at amusement parks, there's these whales, you know, uh, the blackfish, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that movie. But it's the killer whale, right? And you go and you see this beautiful body moving in the pool, moving around, and you see these sort of scientists there, and um, they look really healthy and smart and attractive, and uh, it's a great show. But then after you leave, like videos, you know, turn up on the internet where these scientists are like uh, masturbating the whales, so they can get the sperm and sell the sperm so they can impregnate another whale so they can have a baby and sell it for like millions of dollars. Like this is real. 
Um, so I think these are the things, that's a, that's a really um, true and graphic example, but that's the point of departure um, that I come from. Dear Josephine, I've started to change my shape because I can't stop thinking about your shape. I remember watching it shine and since you are not here, the only option I have is to shine myself, to be able to take those yellow five injections and secrete more liquid calcium than is necessary into my flesh, out of my skin, to form a shell. So next time you see me and you don't recognize me, please, it was only a compliment, only a compliment to completely overhaul myself into you. Okay, so that was an earlier video I made in 2011, and it's an aquarium fish. Um, that's right, the sturgeon fish. Uh, and it's located in the aquarium and I videographed it. And it just kept, fish are curious, you know, they just stare at the camera. Uh, and I put my voice over it. Um, in the video, I think, I think you can tell. But um, I sort of approach uh, scientific language from an intuitive point of view. Um, and here in the video, as I use anthropomorphization as a mask to reveal something about ourselves and the way we move through the world. Um, I think that a lot of people have a problem with anthropomorphization, like scientists and other people get really annoyed when one talks about it, but I think it's a really honest way of, of confronting yourself. Um, for many reasons. Uh, one, because out of curiosity of what it's like to be something else. Um, two, you know, for empathy. Uh, this idea that you can take your, your mind out of your body and stick it in another mind or body. Um, I think it's a really powerful tool. So I use anthropomorphization in a lot of my work So the story of the video, I don't know if you caught it, but if you didn't, you can watch it again online. Um, it's the idea is it's a, a, this fish that was really sad, and it was writing an email to its lover, Josephine, because uh, it got rejected, and so it's the story of unrequited love and how the fish is going to undergo this carbon change and turn itself into its lover. And so it's this like idea that you can become the person that rejected you, like you can become another person and just lo love yourself. Okay, so I'm going to play you another video. We'll see how it goes. This is, this is a clip, and this is a, a video I made in a lab. These are foreskin cells.
see it. The green and pink birds from Papua New Guinea that make the glowing bullseye. The textured multiplicity of a screened-in porch that houses the rings of Saturn's unborn fetus. The foreskin of an eight-year-old boy. It's all there. Can you see it? I wonder who this piece belonged to. Who are you, young boy? All I know is that you are eight and from China. Are you grown up now? Have you spawned? Do you miss the you I am seeing now? Or don't you know it's gone missing? You. So those foreskin cells came from a child in China. Um, and that's all they, that's like when the lab gets that information, that's all it, they really know. Like it just says like what country that sample comes from and um, if it's, if, and it's sex. So I showed you that because I am interested in the dark side of research and, and how we can like advertise this, this sort of like scientific wonderland to be, it's almost like a belief system. Um, And, and I'm interested in sort of playing with, with being critical of, of that approach. Uh, so I want to talk about the voice. I use the voice in a lot of my work. Um, I think there's something powerful about video and cinema where it's like you can create many spaces at one time. Um, and so for me, the voice is the fastest way to connect with my viewer in an authentic way. Um, so right there, like with the microscope and the voice, it was sort of like you were looking at the microscope and inside, it, inside of it, but you were also sort of in my own head or you were, you were in the, 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 the person who was looking down the microscope's head or, or even in the microscope. There's something so beautiful about cinema, how it can, take you to those spaces, that interior and exterior um, point of view, and I'm interested in, how, in that dynamic and how those can switch around uh, very quickly. Um, I also like to use the voice to take control of the narrative and to guide the viewer through like difficult subject matter. Um, a lot of my videos get these funny responses, like sometimes people will laugh because they're not sure if I'm serious, and sometimes people will be taken them really seriously, like it's like very cold and like, like pay attention material. So there's something funny with the, the voice, how it has that power to be misunderstood or understood in, in different situations, um, and, I, and I really enjoy that ambiguity. Right, and of course the disembodiment of the voice is very special, right? When you hear a voice coming out of nowhere. So this is one of the last videos I'm gonna show you. Uh, I think this is probably my smartest video. Maybe come closer to me. Come closer to me. Good. Don't be human. Don't be human. Be animal and sexy and fucking free and hot and dewy. Good. Beautiful. You look, you look beautiful. Keep going. Perfect. 
Perfect. Good. Can you just, just a little bit, a little bit back, like an inch back. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, jiggle that around, shake it around. Do it there, there, right there. Right there, good. Gosh, mesmerizing, totally mesmerizing. You look great. Good. Uh, you're so weird. So good. You're so fucking weird. Who are you? Who even are you? I don't even know what you're doing right now, but it looks fantastic, so just keep doing it. Whatever the fuck you feel like doing, you look great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, good, perfect. Okay, cool. Uh, so this video is special because it speaks to my uh, development in photography. I come from photography, I studied it for ten, like 10 years or something, and it still astounds me how much, even every time I see an image or a photograph, I think it's real. Um, I just am so fascinated by the mirage of photography, the illusion of image making. Um, even when I know it's real, or no, no, wait, even when I know it's fake, it still looks real. <laughs> That's the creepiest part. Um, right, and I just, you know, we could talk about the illusion of photography for hours, but just, to simplify it, uh, the image, the, the photographer not only chooses the subject matter in front, of, in front of you, but they also craft the viewfinder. So it's like this very manipulated version of reality. And I, I'm so fascinated by that and how, how we see the world and we see ourselves through these crafted, these crafted viewfinders. Uh, so here, you know, this speaks to more about like how we monopolize nature and our environment. Um, how when we want it to be something, we make it into that something. Um, So this is an image I made recently, I'm going to talk about it. Uh, this is called Caveats of Non-Quitting. Yeah. Does it look a bit obvious? Okay. It's, it's a little high contrast up there, but I just have to experience it. So I wanted to show you this image because uh, this, those videos I showed you were really important to me because they're very deep. Uh, uh, example of my process. And here with this image, this sort of uh, clues you in more to how I use analog and digital methods of, of image making and art making. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing two images, you're seeing a photograph and a, a photograph of like a beach and a photograph of my studio. And the beach part is a man-made man cliff. And then the studio is like a woman-made, <laughs> that's my word, um, installation. So the idea is like there's all these beauty products here and these sort of uh, sculptures I manipulated. And I wanted to show like this man-made beach some self-care, some like beautifying. And kind of like play with the idea of how we talk about gender when we are in nature. And when we are developing landscape, uh, it always astounds me 
you know, every time I go to a man-made land, man-made island or something, uh, Mm. So I, I wanted to talk about more and more my environments are expanding on the screen before me. Um, the interactions I have with animals and people have multiplied their forms into a more screen-based environment. So what I mean is like, I think so much of my art came from this sort of being in the world and experiencing um, trees and nature and my body and in the city. Um, but more and more, I'm experiencing those things in front of a screen. Like I, you know, I'm watching all these really cute YouTube videos for for uh, to de-stress, and I find like I'm relating with these pandas on a screen more than I am with an animal that lives in my neighborhood. Uh, so I wanted to extend my practice into the screen. Um, and in this way, as you've seen, I've, I start to use fantasy, uh, this sort of um, imaginary tool. Uh, but now, what the images I'm going to show you are sort of where I have really owned staged fantasy, theatrical fantasy, science fiction. Um, you know, has a way to perceive and select our many possible futures. Uh, science fiction is a great way to sort of um, try to predict what's going to happen. Yeah. Mm. You know, and I also wanted to say that um, with this image and this line of work, I'm realizing more and more that as I go through the world and make my art that like it's a form of caregiving and like caretaking to nature and people and things you know it's it's like a kind of a it's really opposite to this like shaping and engineering and like pounding into place it's this sort of way of working within the world that's soft um, sort of soft and powerful instead of like the opposite. Okay. So I'm going to show you a project I did recently. This is called um, Best American Drama, and this is an installation. Hold on one second. And this is an installation I made in Portland at False Front, which is this really cool experimental space that loves to do wild stuff. And what this is, is this is like a feeding trough. This is a, it's like a, I love this piece. So it's all this found, um, it's all this found stuff from like Ikea. So it's like Ikea furniture, it's this found glass. And then um, there are these glass shelves that I took these sort of energy drinks or these life changing like kombuchas or like juices that are marketed to me and I froze them and I put them on the shelves of of the trough and so they melted down the window or the screen of the trough into this that that bottom it's kind of hard to tell but that's actually a, like a watertight sink so like all this like gooey sugary juicy coconut milky stuff is like running down into that throughout the opening. It was such a blast. And the video is these two planets kind of gyrating, like they're kind of booty dancing. And when the guests came, we, we meaning the curator and I, served them cocktails, which was really fun, that matched the stuff in the food in the feeding trough so like it felt if you went to this you it was that really neat thing where like you were drinking this yummy cocktail that matched those ingredients and you felt like you, it could have easily been that you got it out of the feeding trough but you you know like but you didn't um and so what this was was kind of this consideration of well i was watching this video on a melting glacier 
And then this ad popped up and it said like, who's gonna win the best American drama this year? And I remember thinking it was such a strange moment in this, in this time that we all live in where like I'm watching the earth melt and I'm being distracted by this like, like yellow and red ad about who's gonna win some award, you know? Uh, so this is, I imagine this piece as if those, those sort of ways of understanding that information were reversed. So like if global warming news came to me in forms of really slick ads. Um, so, so it's kind of like an end of the world party, or at least it felt like that. A lot of people felt like it was kind of like a big crazy party for the end of the world, but like it was okay. Um, it, it, was, it wasn't totally that uh, because, well, the first night I had that projection up like I just showed you, and then the next day I took it down, and then for the next month it stayed like this. So, like all the liquid and things like that began to change and like get dried out, and um, it eventually attracted uh, raccoons and ants, and the smell, oh God, the smell was like this, oh dear. Um, this like putrid sugar. Have you, I don't know if you've ever brewed beer or like kombucha or anything, but it's just, it's just this fermented smell that like takes you over um, in this tight space. <laughs> so it's pretty wild. And it, you know, it, it was more like the world keeps going and less of like the world ends. It's just like, these are the choices we've made. So here's the detail. And the white stuff is flour, but in like my perfect millionaire world, it would be cocaine. I know, right? It'd be so funny. Uh, there's a detail of it. So it never really got moldy because all that stuff has so many like, um, what do you say, preservatives. But it did get kind of weird and, and, and attract all those things. So. Yeah, so that was that project. Um, another piece I'm gonna show you is this one. And this is kind of a strange image, but I'm gonna do it this way. Can you tell that like the side, the right is the installation? Yeah, I hope so. And then the left are the detail shots. So this is um, an installation called Chroma Key and it uses the green screen effect of cinema and video or movies to experiment with how we make myths about the planet we live on. <laughs> it was really far out and I could talk about it for a really long time. Um, like if you can create your own world on a green screen, then how do we apply that as a filter to our own world? Um, what are the things we could change or, or imagine about our own place and time? Uh, so this is like 15 feet tall, it's a really tall gallery, and it's really small, like 10 feet by 10 feet. And it had all these vines hanging down, and these vines are really th like thorny. So, but not, not painfully thorny, but they kind of catch you. You can't walk by and it gets, it gets stuck on your stuff. Um, and then there's a projector here that's like that big, and it projects up into this sort of rock thing, and then that goes back on this mirror. <laughs> so it's like impossible to document, but I imagine this place where you could go in a green, like if a green screen was a point of travel, you could go there and watch sort of this sensual, sexual scene play out in front of you. Um, I, th I think it's, I think I, also, I think I wish for like some earthly gods instead of some, instead of the sky gods to sort of come alive. Um, I'm gonna run through these. And then this is an installation I did. It's called The Pathway of Stranger Living. 
And this is a big installation. This is like 45 feet long, and this is 15 feet tall. So, you know, any, you know, like I showed you those videos with like the microscope, so you could get a sense of like scale, really, but not physical scale, but more like a conceptual scale. Again, it's that like fractal pattern, like zooming up thing. Uh, so this is a taxidermied rainbow, or that's how I conceptualized it. And it's made out of donated bed sheets from this hospital and rope, wood, wire, glue, and two projections. Um, and for me, this piece speaks to like the intimacy and uh, excuse me, uh, the way we value intimacy in American society. Uh, it seems to be. It seems to be something that I come back to again and again. So the idea was that strangers would kind of walk through here together, um, because this was at a big art show, where like uh, like twenty thousand people saw this, which is just so you know, if, just so for you artists out there, um, when you have a piece and you want to, you have to choose like what piece like twenty thousand people see. It's a really hard choice. You know, that's like a really weird position to be in, I think. So start thinking about those things. <laughs> it's like, what one thing would you show all those folks? Um, anyway, so the point here is that this was found materials and like, I felt like the bed sheets spoke to the, um, the idea about intimacy and um, kind of like the decay or the death of things being sacred. Um, I wanted to make this like, holographic rainbow because I felt that like if I didn't, somebody else was going to do it really soon, but they were going to do it and they were going to sell it. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in that sort of like edge between wonder and, and critical, and critical discussion. Um, this piece, I wanted people to ex have an experience and a, where like my you know my parents aren't into art, where my parents are could see something and, and see something in it, and also um, to keep it in this thoughtful place. So let's see what else. Okay, so okay, great. This is the last thing I'm going to show you. Um, and you're the first people that I'm going to show this, <laughs> which feels like such a gift. So thank you so much for just being here and being an audience. Um, so this is a project I'm, I'm going to end this talk with a work in progress. Uh, this is a project I'm working on right now called Sunken Hot House, and it's where I go to Florida, and I am conceptualized as this sort of hairy mermaid, and I am... Ex investigating or considering uh, coral bleaching. But it also has a lot of like desire in it and I don't know, it's theater. So this is me and I'm wearing, I have these great barnacle eyebrows on. Um, gosh, there's so much I could say about it. I think I'm gonna show you the video first and then we can kind of go from there.
on that project for about four months and it has a lot of threads like what happens when the environment becomes digital uh, what happens to like the, the myth of the mermaid and how she's sexualized um, and then just like this almost educational but I, I have a hard time saying that word um, to direct to tra trajectory of the bleaching of the coral reef and this is a uh, nice for me because it gets me back home to my roots and um, yeah, I'm gonna stop it there. I think that's I think that's pretty good. I think I've said enough. So again, thanks so much for your time and your um, been a great listeners. Thank you. And, okay. And I don't know. Do you usually do questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you want, if you have a question for me, I'll try to to my best to answer it, but, you know, no pressure. Yeah? Uh, I was uh, kind of struck by how much, like, humor plays a role in, like, kind of disarming me towards, mm -hmm. like, kind of the silliness of the yeah. images kind of come together and make me think about a lot of the bigger conceptual issues that you're kind of dealing with nature and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how, like, how aware are you of You know, that's such a fun question because I feel like art has the power to, has, there's a lot of room in there for artists to sort of wiggle around in. Um, for me, when I make this, I'm not trying to be funny, but it's, I'm so happy I am. <laughs> you know, it was such a relief to hear people laugh and be like, oh, at least I've made them laugh. And, and then as time went on, I realized that I'm giving, I'm giving a lot of ideas in one package, you know, I'm, um, a maximalist. I like a lot of things in, in one thing. And the only way that people, I think, are really going to accept that without feeling completely confused is through the laugh. You know, it's very, who doesn't love to laugh? So, and it's tricky because it's like that weird thing when you're in your studio. Like, I can't, if, I'm try, if I try to be funny, it's not funny. Well, like, if you're dressing yourself in like a furry costume and putting on like barnacle eyebrows, aren't you like it's gonna be hilarious? Yeah. Or I'm like, or really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so. I mean, it's like one of those things where like I get a kick out of it, so I hope that's good enough, right? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Did I hear you say that you're have received some grant money? Mm. Florida project, mm -hmm. or um, how do you, oh, would you launch an 
do a project without necessarily having the funding? Yes. Does that, does that <laughs> need to be a part of it in order for you to just, you know, kind of mm -hmm. mentally or emotionally remind mm -hmm. yourself to get that kind of... What a generous question. Um, that's such a tricky part of art making, right? It's like... Because it's so, it's cause some of this stuff is really just about logistics. Um, let's see. I usually am the person to put the, uh, how do they say, the cart before the horse. So I think about the idea and I get it. I'm like, this is going to be amazing. And I write this huge proposal and then it gets rejected because there's no work. You know, because people really like that. They really like if you have like, a couple slides or just something to show them because we I think as artists we think that everybody is really imaginative and can think in pictures but not everybody can do that it was like shocking to find that out um, so you actually have to show for, so for me it's worked better if I make a little bit of it or if I make a really beautiful sketch and um, then I I guess I'm sort of going on a tangent about how to get a grant, but, and then I write a proposal and I have somebody edit it. Uh, so for this, I got funding. And let's, let's see, I was really nervous about this one because this one I want to be kind of provocative. And in Seattle, I think here you have the Precipice Fund. I, th I think you can get that in Vancouver. Um, but in Seattle, we don't have something like that. We have city grants, so it's taxpayers' money. So you can't, it's really tricky, you can't do like some weirdo art project and get, expect to get taxpayer money for it. So, I was, so for this piece, I made like an educational version. <laughs> I made an educational version, um, which wasn't like super educational, but I just took out some of like the super far out stuff. Um, and I've, I've actually learned that a lot of artists do that, a lot of filmmakers do that. Um, they kind of edit what they show the grant committee, you know, and then they just, at the end of the day, they just make whatever they want. <laughs> they show whatever version they want. Yeah, a lot of, like, even, like, in the early 1900s, even. It's like, really, well, this filmmaker that I like did that in the early 1900s, but, yeah, just, like, two versions. So, and then, let's see, funding. I mean, the bigger it gets, the more funding you need, you know? So I guess it's like how much you love an idea. Yeah. Gotta choose them. Yeah, um, I'd love to like ask you that too, because it's such a, I think that's a common issue. Yeah, if you're gonna be a working artist, get, expect to be writing grants and like, learning how to adapt, um, adapt your project to what the panel wants. I know it kind of hurts a little, but it, it, it's worth it. Yeah. Anything, anything about, so working art, like anything else? Y'all are so quiet. Such good listeners. Okay. Well, at any time, feel free to contact me. I, th I think with that, I'll just, we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much. Yeah.